Tonight we're going to learn how to fight like a Christian. <laughs> you see, we are in a war and we do fight, but we have to learn how to fight a totally different way than the world fights. And being angry <clears throat> is not the answer. We're going to talk about anger. You'd be amazed at how many people, even in here tonight, people who love Jesus, have anger issues. They have anger and bitterness and resentment in them for many, many, many different reasons. And some people have had it so long that they don't even really know that's what it is anymore. And it's time for us to deal with anger, to look at it for what it is and learn how to handle it. Anger is an emotion that people in the world don't, they don't think there's a problem with it. But Christians very early on learn that anger can be a real problem. And so we fall into a trap of feeling guilty every time we get angry about anything and thinking, well, as a Christian, I shouldn't feel that way. And I went through the same thing. One morning I was going to go preach. This has been many, many, many years ago when I was still doing a, a ladies meeting at my church in St. Louis. It's been probably 25 years ago. And um, I'm so grateful for the lessons that God has taught me, the things that he's shown me along the way on my journey and grateful that I have an opportunity to share them with you and maybe save you some trips around the mountain. And so Dave and I had had an argument and I was really mad. And, you know, anger and preaching doesn't go together very well. And I mean, I didn't have long. I had maybe an hour and I had to get to the church and lead this meeting, several hundred people there. And I was mad. And I felt guilty because I was mad. And God showed me something that morning that was really very life-changing to me. Somehow or another, I ended up in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27. I don't remember if I just went there out of desperation knowing it was a scripture about anger or if the Holy Spirit led me there, but I saw it in a different way than what I had ever seen it before. And I want us to take a look at it tonight, maybe in a way that will be life-changing for you. When you're angry, do not sin. Now, that was really the message right there. We'll get onto the rest of it in a minute, but that was where I got my revelation. It, it doesn't say don't get angry. It doesn't say if you ever get angry. It says when you're angry. <laughs> We're all going to have times when we feel angry. And it's not necessarily all wrong. I mean, sometimes it can be wrong. You're angry about something that's not even somebody else's fault, but I mean, when people hurt us, when they're selfish and self-centered, when they do things to us, when they don't treat us right, when they talk about us, when they tell lies about us, we feel angry. So it's not feeling angry that's a problem. It's what you do with it after you feel it. You see, if there's one life message, well, one of a few that I would like to leave with people. One of, I feel like, my life messages that I can hopefully impact the body of Christ with is that you can't help how you feel, but you can help how you behave. And just because I feel something, that doesn't mean I have to act on what I feel if it's going to cause me to behave ungodly. And if I don't feel something, that doesn't mean that I still can't behave the way that I'm supposed to. We have feelings, but we don't have to let them have us. We have feelings, they're rather fickle, they come when you don't want them, leave when you do want them. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Boy, man, on Sunday night after dinner, you can feel like going on a diet and losing 50 pounds. You know what I'm talking about? Monday morning comes and you don't feel so much like you did the night before. We can feel like getting out of debt and yet at the same time feel like spending too much money. 
we can feel like cleaning our house and yet feel like laying down on the couch. So, <laughs> feelings for all intent and purposes are just very unreliable and very unpredictable. And uh, sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not. So you really just can't pay too much attention to them or you get yourself in a whole lot of trouble. And I sometimes think maybe the less attention we paid to all the feelings we have in the flesh, maybe the more we would feel what we should feel in the spirit. We can't let our emotions, our fleshly emotions dictate to us our behavior. See, when I was not nearly as strong in God, even though I was a Christian, I still did a lot of what I felt like doing. And if somebody made me mad, then I was mad. And if I felt like telling them off, I told them off. And if I felt like talking about them, I talked about them. And if I felt like putting a wall up and shutting them out of my life for three weeks, I did that too. But the more I've grown in Christ and the more I've come to understand his word, the more I've learned that I don't have the luxury of acting on all of my feelings. And I really wish the feelings would go away, but they don't always. So it's not necessarily my feelings that God's going to change. It's me he's going to change so I can be stronger than they are. <clears throat> if there's anything that we need as children of God, we need to stop praying for all of our opposition to go away. Paul never prayed for people's problems to go away. You cannot find a place in the Bible where Paul prayed for their problems to go away. He prayed for them to endure whatever came with good temper. He prayed for them to have self-control and discipline and no matter what was going on in their life to behave the same as if it wasn't going on. And so this is a big challenge for us because we just so love to tell people how we feel. I feel, I don't feel, I feel, I feel, I don't feel, I don't feel, I feel, I feel. Can I tell you how I feel? Well, yes, I mean, I think we need to be in touch with our feelings and I think we need to own our feelings, but we also need to deny them the right to control us. Now, you might need to think this over a little bit because this is a huge problem in people's lives. And, um, you know, if, if you get pretty proficient at not letting your feelings control you, then they will get weaker and weaker because anything only lives if you feed it. And so the way to, to kill things is to just stop feeding them, stop giving in to them. And then they start losing their power over you. And what once was extremely hard is no longer as hard as it once was. So we all have feelings, can't always do anything about that, but we have to choose not to act on the feelings if we know it's against the word of God. And believe me, you do have a free will and you can make a choice. I said you do have a free will and you can make a choice. You do have a free will and you can make a choice. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit given to us so we can control, guess who? See how smart you are? At least this section over here is. Shall we do it again? Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit that's given to us to help us control who? All right, you all passed the test. So we have to get rid of the, I can't help it. It's just too hard. <laughs> now, I admit that if you let your feelings, especially anger, if you let it get into a rage, then you may be at the point of not being able to control yourself. That's why we need to learn how to recognize things when they're first beginning to happen 
how to take every thought captive before they become a stronghold in our mind, how to resist the devil at his onset, at the very beginning when the enemy first begins to tempt you, that's when you get away from sin. Come on, you don't flirt with it for three weeks, hoping that you're not going to be the one that's going to get caught. Don't be like the little girl that was walking down the mountain path and she saw this serpent laying in the road and he, it was very cold and he begged her to pick, will you pick me up and put me inside your coat? I'm very cold. And she said, well, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that. And he said, oh, please pick me up. I'm very cold. Will you just put me inside your coat? So she picked him up, put him inside of her coat. And a little bit later he bit her and she said, why did you bite me? He said, you knew what I was when you picked me up. We can go slow, that's okay. <laughs> you know, you don't all of a sudden get into an adulterous affair. <laughs> it starts with flirting. It starts with thinking the person that you're married to isn't, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not. It goes from one thing to the next, from a coffee to a donut to a lunch to a... To telling this person now all your problems about your pitiful, pathetic, bad marriage. <laughs> well, anyway, that's not on the program either, but. <laughs> See, if we would just, I mean, you know, you've heard the saying around, you know, you need to nip it in the bud early. Well, that's really, I mean, we need the sooner, the better, the sooner we take action, the better it is. And when you feel yourself getting angry, the sooner you say, no, not going to live like this. You see, anger, if it's not controlled is poison to your soul. And this phrase came to me today, so I hope it's not too far out there, but I think when we allow ourselves to get bitter and resentful and we have deep seated rooted anger in us, I think it's like committing spiritual suicide. That doesn't mean you lose your salvation, but it just kills everything that God wants to do in your life. What does anger solve? Well, I learned a great lesson that morning as God took me to Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, be angry and sin not. So I realized that God must be saying that there was a way to be angry and not to sin. And that is, is to make a decision about what you're going to do with the anger before it's managing you. Then he goes on to say, how many of you ever get angry? Just wanted to see if I had the right group. I didn't know if maybe I need to change my message or not. When you're angry, do not sin. Verse 26, do not ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fury, or your indignation last until the sun goes down. You know, if you happen to get mad in the morning, you got all day, but <laughs> if it happens on the way to bed, you're in trouble. All joking aside, it's obvious that he's saying here that when you get angry, you will get angry when there's injustice. That's not a sin, but God's saying, I've got a better way for you to fight your battles. I'm going to teach you how to fight like a Christian. <laughs> Instead of doing what you would have done before you were saved and just let that anger control you and start spitting all kinds of poisonous things out of your mouth. You can say, God, help me, help me. I know that this is not going to get me anywhere. I know this is wrong, but I'm not going to act on this. I'm going to control myself and I'm going to trust you to take care of this situation. We have an option. Thank God we don't have to take care of ourselves. Come on. Some of you need to retire from self care and just throw a big retirement party. Is there anybody in this place that's tired of trying to protect yourself all the time? 
and trying to make everybody pay you back for what they did to you or what they didn't give you. Surely there's got to be somebody in this building night or somebody watching by television that you have been angry long enough and you're, you're ready to say, I'm not willing to live angry anymore. But I had a lot of anger for a lot of valid reasons. Anger can be very valid. You can have a real reason to be angry, <clears throat> but still Jesus is saying, you don't really have any right to because that's not the way I want you to live. I've got a better plan. I'm going to teach you how to fight like a Christian. Amen. When you're angry, don't sin. Don't ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fury, or indignation last until the sun goes down. Leave no such room or foothold for the devil. Give him no such opportunity. When we stay angry, it's an open invitation for the devil to come in and wreak havoc in our lives. God's got a better plan. Anger is only one letter away from danger. You stick a D on the front of it, and you got danger. And let me tell you that we are living in an angry world today. I am astonished, really, at the violence and how the violence in the world is escalating. I mean, even just the things that we've heard on the news in just in this one week, stabbings and shootings and young people going wild on the beaches and having to be arrested and young people after ball games that they won going out and doing all kinds of violent acts. And we just, we just go, what is going on? And I believe that one of the things that God has showed me is, of course, we know that, you know, there's a great decline of morality in our society. And anywhere that, well, let's just put it like this. The less morality we have, the, the more anarchy we're going to have. The more violence, the more crime. The more people that are just going wild. And so this whole nonsense that's going on in the world today about trying to get God out of everything is absolutely, I mean, it's not even just ungodly. It is just very dangerous, extremely dangerous. People have to have something good to hope for. They have to have hope of change. And, and if, you, if you believe there's no God, then there's no hope. There's none. And you know what I think? This just came to me this week, but I really believe that a lot of these people that are perpetrating all these horrible acts of violence, I think they're angry people that are without hope. They, they have no, they don't know how to win their battles. They don't, they don't have anybody to help them. They don't know anybody to talk to. And they just know that things are wrong and they're mad about it. And many of them have probably had things happen to them, but because they don't know God and they don't know how to let God fight their battles, then they get angrier and angrier and angrier, and that anger turns into resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness, and then it turns into rage, and then we have it. The enemies of Israel, several times it says in the Bible that their enemies were afraid of them <laughs> because they saw the hand of God on them. And so we need to make sure that we just don't have a little dab of religion every now and then. We need to have a full on, on fire, stirred up relationship with God. And that means, now I want you to listen to me, that means we have to stop playing games and kind of dabbling around as a Christian. And we need to get serious about doing things God's way. And I just want to share with you tonight that it is not acceptable. Being an angry Christian is an oxymoron. It just does not go together at all. You say, well, I'm not mad about anything. Well, if you're not, you're one of the blessed few, let me tell you. You say, well, how do you know that? You don't know if I'm angry. Listen, I've been doing this a long time. I mean, this is not my first go around here. 
And I have never, never, not one time ever preached on anger, bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, strife. Not one time ever. And at the end of the session, ask how many people were having problems with that right now and they needed prayer and they were ready to turn away from it. I've never had less than 70 to 80% of everybody, everybody in the entire building stand up. So we have got a lot of angry Christians. <laughs> And you have to understand where there's no peace, there's no power. Where there's no peace, there's no power. Jesus had power over the storm because he didn't let the storm get in him. So we got a lot of things to talk about tonight and tomorrow morning about dealing with anger instead of letting it deal with us. Anger is one letter away from danger. James 1, 19 and 20. Understand this, my beloved brethren. Let every man be quick to hear, a ready listener, slow to speak, slow to take offense, and slow to get angry. <laughs> the Bible says that God is slow to anger. For man's anger, now I want you to get this, man's anger does not promote the righteousness of that God desires. In other words, anger is not the right way to behave. And listen to what I'm going to say. Anger is not the right way to solve your problems. There's nobody in here that has ever solved your problems through being angry. It never makes anything better. You get two angry people yell at each other. And now you've got a real problem. Be slow to speak, quick to hear, slow to anger, slow to take offense. Let's be the kind of people that it's almost impossible to make us mad. Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> and I know it's possible because, I mean, I had a quick temper. I was angry more than I wasn't. And sometimes I was verbal about it, and sometimes it was just something seething on the inside of me. When we get angry, if we have unresolved anger, we either explode or we implode. We either fall apart inside or we're blowing up at somebody. And a lot of times, you're taking it out on people that had nothing to do with what you're angry about. You know, if we don't understand this kind of stuff and we don't resolve these issues, a man can get mad at work because he didn't get the raise he thought he deserved. And go home and take it out on his kids and his wife. And that goes on all the time. And a lot of it is because we don't own our anger. We don't admit, I'm angry about this. And I'm angry because it wasn't right. It wasn't just. I did deserve that raise. But God, right now, I'm going to release this to you. I mean, do you really think that you can get yourself a raise any quicker than God can? Oh, listen, we have no idea what God would do for us if we just let him. I said, we have no idea what God would do for us if we would just let him. We're so afraid that we're not going to get what we want. Listen, if God can't give me what I want, then I have no business wanting it. I said, if God can't give you what you want, you have no business wanting it. Just because I want it doesn't mean it's right for me to have it. So the deeper you get into a relationship with God, the more you can trust him to do what's right for you. And you learn that nobody on this planet, not the devil and no person, can take anything away from you that God wants you to have. Now that's the way to fight like a Christian. Now let's look at three places in Proverbs. Proverbs 15, 18. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger <laughs> appeases contention. Proverbs 16, 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his own spirit is better than he who takes an entire city. You know what it means to rule your own spirit? It's this whole thing that I'm talking about, about self-control and not just going with every feeling that we have. 
Come on, let's get honest tonight. How much are you ruling your spirit? How much are you ruling your fleshly feelings and your emotions, your words, your thoughts, your feelings, and how much are they ruling you? This is the place that we're at. This is like the next thing on the blackboard to grow in. Don't think you came here for no reason. You didn't come just to see what I look like in person. Well, maybe you did, but whatever God uses to get you in, that's fine with me. <laughs> we got to get ready for the war that's coming. We got to get ready. The Bible says that in the day the Lord returns, people will just be going about their business just like everything is just as normal as it can be. And suddenly, like a thief in the night... Christ is going to come, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We don't want to keep putting stuff off. I'm not going to be perfect when Jesus comes back, but I'll tell you what, I want to be further along than where I am right now. I don't think it matters to God that we're perfected or not. He already knew what he was getting when he got us. But I'll tell you one thing. God wants to see us pressing on. And he wants to see us serious about growing up in him and doing things God's way. Jesus has given us a new life. And he says, you've got to put off the old man and put on the new man. And you can do it. But you need to want to. You need to really want to. You need to want to enough to pay the price. Proverbs 22, 24, and 25 even say, don't, don't associate with somebody that's angry, lest you learn their ways. So this is a pretty serious thing. There are many angry people. In the world today. Now, some people have been angry so long they don't even really know that they're angry anymore. They've just become bitter, cynical, negative, critical. A lot of angry people are depressed. That's the root of their depression. Not all, but some people just have all these unresolved issues in their life. Do you know how long I was mad that I was sexually abused by my father? And I didn't go around really consciously aware that I was mad about that. <laughs> but any time that you've had something taken from you that you have a right to have, if you didn't have a father, if you didn't have a mother, if, if one of your parents was an alcoholic or there was, a, there was a problem and you were cheated out of something, there's a part of you that says that's not right. And I fought the world's way for a long time. I was angry and harsh and hard. And nobody was going to push me around. Nobody was going to tell me what to do. And I was trying to be a Christian like that. I loved God. But I had not gotten serious enough with God to say, I want to do it your way. And I think maybe if there's any benefit that I might hope to be to the body of Christ, it's in helping believers mature and grow up. It's time to get rid of our diapers, our pacifiers, and our baby bottles. <laughs> Babies can act however they feel, but it's not very attractive on a 40-year-old man. It's a good thing we had a good time with God before I started this. <laughs> the Bible even says in Hebrews 12 that we should watch out for one another, lest any root of bitterness and resentment get in among us. So let's help each other. When somebody's telling you their sad story about how mad they are, encourage them to let that go and give it over to God. Tell them how, what a waste of time it's going to be and just encourage people. I know it's not right and I understand why you feel the way you do, but you know, can we pray together and 
turn that over to God. Would you be willing to give it over to God and let God be God? You see, God didn't like what happened to me when I was a child either. I wasn't the only one that didn't like it. He didn't like it. And actually it made him angry. Now God is not an angry God, but he can get angry and he gets angry at injustice, but he knows how to fight the right way. Got to learn how to fight like a Christian. Let's look at Mark chapter three. Again, Jesus went into a synagogue and a man was there who had one withered hand as a result of an accident or disease. And the Pharisees, <laughs> you know, the Pharisees really annoyed Jesus. And they actually did make him angry. It was a righteous anger. It wasn't a wrong anger. There is anger that's wrong, but there's also a righteous anger. And the Pharisees kept watching Jesus closely to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might get a charge to bring against him formally. Hmm. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, now, I love this because, see, this goes back to what we we're preaching last night. Jesus knew that he was about to make him mad, and I think he kind of arranged to do it on purpose. <laughs> so he said to the man with a withered hand, get up and come and stand here. He didn't even do it in private. He said, come here and stand here right in the middle. <laughs> Woo, I love it. Come on, just get out here. If we're going to do this, let's just really show the dumb people. <laughs> I mean, if Jesus didn't want to make a ruckus, he could have just kind of took the man off to the side and not stirred up the Pharisees. But he wasn't going to be controlled by them. <laughs> Verse 4, and he said to them, is it lawful and right on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To have life or to take it? But they kept silent. And he glanced around at them with vexation and anger. Everybody say, Jesus was angry. Jesus. Grieved at the hardness of their hearts. And now, I just love, I hope you can make this jump with me here. So what did Jesus do next? And he said to the man, hold out your hand. He held it out and his hand was completely restored. So now... <laughs> Boy, if we can get this tonight, we can learn how to fight like God would fight. We can learn how to fight like a Christian. These people made him mad. And instead of turning away from his assignment from God and arguing with the Pharisees and trying to convince them they were wrong, Jesus' response to the anger that he felt was to heal a sick man. Come on, we'll sneak up on you, but you'll get it. <laughs> the only way to fight like a Christian, the only way to fight like God is to overcome evil with good. From the beginning of time, we have been in a battle. The earth has been in a battle between good and evil. It has always been raging. It started in the garden and it has never stopped, but it is escalating today, especially in the Western world. Now, a lot of these things, I mean, the rest of the world has been so bad for so long that we can't even imagine. And we need a great return of morality. But in the meantime, those of us that do represent God, that are what he calls the light of the world, we have to press in like never before to represent Jesus, to be Christ-like in our behavior, and we have to learn how to fight like God would fight, and that is, is you don't return evil for evil. You don't return anger for anger. But when somebody does you wrong, you go out and help somebody else. <laughs> now, this is really a spiritual secret, and... A lot of people never get it. They just 
they just never get it. But I hope that you can get it. And I hope all the people watching by TV can get this. If you can learn how to fight like this, you will win every battle. And I know that some of you, when, you know, when I share these things, I can see the looks on some people's. It's almost like you're disgusted with my whole message because you're just thinking, hmm, don't even try to tell me that I'm supposed to go home and be nice to this jerk. Listen, I didn't say you need to let people abuse you. I think that there are times when we need to exercise what I would like to refer to as controlled anger. And that's the kind of thing where somebody's not treating you right and you know that for their sake you need to confront them. You pray about it. You ask for God's perfect timing. And then you go, not in a rant and a rave and a rage, and you calmly tell them, you are mistreating me, you are disrespecting me, it's not right, and I don't intend to live like this. And can I tell you this? Sometimes the less you say, the greater effect it has. Too many words means nobody remembers anything. Boy, that was good. You know, I just did not act good for the first several years of our marriage and just angry. And you know, people that are angry down deep inside, you just don't behave well. And Dave's a very patient, long suffering man, a very godly man. And he had no intention of not trying to see things through to the finish, but I'll never forget one day we were in the back bedroom of the first house that we owned, and we had a mirrored closet, like a double door closet, and there was the whole thing was mirrored, and he was standing in part of in front of part of it, and I was standing kind of back over here, and he turned around and he looked at me and he said, You know what? If I depend on how you treat me to tell me what kind of a man I am, I'd be in bad shape. <laughs> and he said, if this continues, I'm just letting you know right now, I don't know what I'll end up doing. Didn't say nothing else. Wasn't angry, didn't shout, didn't yell. But it was time. <laughs> It was God's time for him to confront me. Now, did anybody hear what I said? You know, you're not going to get anywhere if somebody's yelling at you and you're like, and let me tell you about it. <laughs> and then they go, you're and then the kids come in the room, they're like, oh. <laughs> and then after about a half an hour of that, you don't even know what you were fighting about. All you know is you're mad. Is anybody understanding me? I know what I'm talking about. I, I, God revealed, thankfully, that secret to me in the Word, and I can show it to you in 10 scriptures. Or the proper response to being mistreated, to being abused, is to pray, bless, and do good to overcome evil. It is a secret that the devil cannot understand. Mean people cannot understand it. Only a believer in Jesus Christ can understand it. It is the only way for a Christian to fight and ever win their battles. Now, I know that that's irritating to your flesh. I get it. Because we just, we're so mad. We're so mad. <laughs> Do I look mad? I'm really sure. I'm so mad. <laughs> Let me 
and if you think that you're gonna treat me that way, just tell me something. And God is saying, really? I mean, really? Has that ever worked? <laughs> is anybody in the building ready to try God's plan? Now, <laughs> it will be hard on your flesh because you may not get instantaneous results. Let me tell you a secret that I've learned. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do what's right a long time before you get a right result. So if you're only going to try this once to see if it works, you know, I'm not offering you a magic charm tonight, you know. Somebody mistreats you and you go help some little old lady across the street, now all your problems are solved. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about lifestyle here. I'm talking about devil. You've got enough of my life. You're not getting any more of it. I mean, listen, as long as we keep buying into the enemy's system, he can make us mad 50 times a week. We're mad because somebody cut us off in traffic and we're mad because somebody took our parking place. I don't have no time for that anymore. If I'm waiting for a parking place and some goofball comes and whoosh, I just, <sighs> bless you. Hope you enjoy that. Wow, that's not right that they did that and I'm not going to put up with that and I'm going to tell them off. Okay. See you when I come back in a couple of years. We can talk about it again. up to you. You know, I'm right. There's always going to be somebody out there to annoy you. Getting mad about it, it's not going to make them go away. God uses them. For all you know, God arranged for that guy to be there to get that parking place. Just to pull out of you the very thing that he wanted to pull out of you. So hopefully you would finally see it and deal with it because if it's in you it's gonna sneak out <laughs> Romans 12 17 repay no one evil for evil <laughs> but take thought for what is honest and proper and noble aiming to be above reproach in the sight of everyone if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I think we needed to be reminded of this. But if your enemy's hungry, feed him. <laughs> if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not let yourself be overcome by evil, but overcome and master evil with good. <laughs> Psalm 37, 1 through 8. Verse 1. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. One day I read that scripture and a lady out in the audience yelled out, that's me, Sister Fret. <laughs> Fret not yourself because of evildoers, neither be envious against those who work unrighteousness, that which is not right or in right standing with God, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. <laughs> Trust lean on, rely on, and be confident in the Lord, and do good. Trust, lean on, rely on, and be confident in the Lord, and do good. <laughs> 
Here's the way to fight like a Christian. When there's an evildoer that has done wrong, don't fret yourself. But instead, lean on, rely on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord. And while you're trusting God, do good. You know, if you can learn to understand this, the devil will finally get smart enough to go bug somebody besides you. I mean, if every time he attacks you, you're going to go bless somebody else, why bother? <laughs> yeah, you'll laugh a lot more when you really start doing this. Trust. Lean on, rely on, and be confident in the Lord, and do good. And you shall dwell in the land, and feed surely on his faithfulness, and truly you shall be fed. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, now, we're still talking about when the evildoer is still being evil, how we're supposed to behave. Commit your way to the Lord. Roll and repose each care of your load on him. Trust, lean on, rely on, and be confident also in him, and he will bring it to pass. You know, the first thing to do when somebody mistreats you is to, to say, God, this hurts, and I'm angry about it. But I know that my anger won't solve the problem or change the person. So I trust you. And I'm going to keep my assignment. I'm going to keep being a Christian. I'm going to keep my light turned on. I'm going to keep doing good because that's what you put me here for. And I'm going to commit my way to you, delight myself in you, and I'm going to watch you bring to pass what I could never do, not in a million years. Verse 6, and he will make your uprightness and right standing with God. Go forth as the light, and your justice and right as the shining of the noonday. Be still and rest in the Lord. Wait for him and patiently lean yourself upon him. Fret not yourself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked devices to pass. Verse 8, cease from anger. And forsake wrath, fret not yourself, it tends only to evil doing. So when evil happens to us, we don't want to respond with more evil doing. We want to overcome evil with good. I started talking to you last night about anger, and we started in Ephesians 4. That says, when you're angry, do not sin. Don't ever let the sun go down on your anger. So it doesn't say that if you get angry, when you get angry. We all experience anger at different times in our life. The feeling of anger is not a sin. It's what we do with that anger that can become a sin. You don't want to repress it. You don't want to express it wrongly. We need to control ourselves. That's why God has given us self-control. I want to encourage you to teach your children properly about anger. Don't make them think that every time they get angry that they're doing something wrong, but teach them to control their anger and not get violent and do things that don't make any sense. If you want your children to not be angry children, then you need to not be an angry parent. Because if they're living in a house full of anger, they're going to pick up your habits. That's exactly what I did from my father. And so we started learning last night how to fight like a Christian. When somebody mistreats us or abuses us, the answer to it is not to try to get them back. It's not to return evil for evil, but it's to trust God and do good. Put our trust in God. God, you're our vindicator. 
I trust you to deal in the proper way with people who have mistreated me. And I'm going to continue to do good. I'm not going to turn away from my God given assignment to deal with all the mean people in the world. I'm going to stay focused on what God has called me to do. I'm going to keep helping people. And when I help people, I'm sowing a seed then for my breakthrough in life. We can easily understand. Let's just say that there's a hundred people called to do different things in the kingdom, to help the poor, to be missionaries, preach the gospel, worship leaders, whatever. So let's just say a hundred little demons are sent out from hell every day, one assigned to each one of those called anointed Christians. And all that demon's job is, is to set them up, to get them upset, to offend them, to put people in their way that will uh, mistreat them, to hurt them. And so if these hundred Christians... don't understand what I'm talking about today or what God teaches in his word, then they're going to spend all their time fighting these battles. They're going to stay angry all the time. They're going to complain all the time. They're going to get bitter and resentful, and they're not going to accomplish what God has called them to do. It's very easy to understand that we war not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. And we are in a war, and we do need to fight but we have to learn how to fight like a Christian. The only way that you can overcome evil is with good. You cannot fight evil with evil. You cannot fight anger with anger. The only way, understand me today, the only way, the only way to overcome evil is with good. God does not stop being good because the world is full of evil. Did you hear me? God does not stop being good because the world is evil. Now, we do have to fight a fight. We are in a war. The body of Christ is said to be an army, the army of God. And there's places in the Bible where we're referred to as soldiers in the army of God. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, Paul said to Timothy that he was to fight the good fight of faith. So... When you're being attacked, one of the ways to fight is just to stay in faith and to keep saying and keep saying and keep saying, God, no matter what's going on in my life, I trust you. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of the eternal life to which you were summoned and for which you confessed the great confession of faith before many witnesses. So he's saying, don't just tell people, but fight that good fight of faith. Do you realize that when you've got a problem and instead of getting upset about it, 
you open your mouth and say, God, I trust you. That you're fighting like a Christian. Come on, let's say it again. When you have a problem. When you find out that somebody lied about you. When somebody didn't invite you to the party. When somebody rejected you. When somebody ignored you. Those are minor things. Let's go deeper. When somebody abuses you, when somebody misuses you, when you don't get the raise that you justly deserved at work, when somebody else gets the promotion that you should have had, anger is not the way to solve the problem. Now you're going to feel anger. The first response is you're going to feel anger, and I would too. But that's not my clue to just go ahead and get angry and have a fit. Just because I feel anger. What I need to do is say, uh-oh, the devil's trying to steal from me again. God, thank you for the fruit of self-control. By your grace and mercy, I'm going to just calm down. Calm down. And if you have a hard time calming down, you need to try what we had here earlier when we were worshiping God and Jackie was singing that song about the Holy Spirit, get yourself some good worship music. And if you're on the verge of having a fit, turn it on, get in a room by yourself and just go. Oh. Okay. Now, Lord, I feel like, but thankfully I don't have to because I'm a new creature. So here's my response, and I would speak it out of my mouth. Here is my response to the attack against me. God, I trust you. I trust you. I will say of the Lord, Psalm 91, 1 and 2, verse 2, I will say of the Lord, I will put my trust in him. He is my refuge. I will say of the Lord, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can come against. If you don't want to be defeated by the devil, just hang out in the presence of God. Keep saying, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. God, I trust you. I need to stay another week and teach some of you how to talk out loud. And I mean to do something besides murmur about all your circumstances. And then I would follow that up by saying, now, God, I've learned how to fight like a Christian. So I'm asking you to show me somebody that I can bless. Come on. I know this is new. Let's just go ahead and go through the gate this morning. Okay. You're being attacked. Let's just make up a story. Pastor has been faithful. He's had an associate pastor. He's loved and blessed and he pays him well and he respects him and he honors him and the guy gets good vacation. And so the guy gets it in his head that he should have his own ministry. So instead of doing it right and going to the pastor and telling him what's in his heart and asking him to help him and how's the right way to go about this, he begins to cause dissension by finding things wrong with the pastor and talking about the pastor among the other people that he knows in the congregation. I don't know, you know, a pastor seems to me like he's kind of losing his anointing. And did you see that new car he bought? I bet, he, you know, I'm not giving my money for him to drive some big fancy car. And you see that jewelry his wife wears? I mean, that, that's a little much, don't you think? And you know, their kids are quite unruly. I mean, they don't make their kids mind at all. So he stirs up enough other stupid people, excuse me, but that's what they are. It's bad enough for somebody to do that, but it, 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 we're just as dumb as they are if we listen to them. When somebody comes to you finding fault with somebody, especially somebody that you have loved and admired that's working hard to help you, you need to come back with, well, you know, I don't know about that, but I do know that they've helped me a lot. My life has changed. They're faithful. They're dedicated. They're diligent. Listen to me. It's a trap. It's a demonic trap. 
Offense comes from a Greek word called scandalon, which means the bait that was hung on a trap that lured an animal into the trap for destruction. So when the devil stirs up strife and tries to get us offended, he's baiting us. John Bevere wrote a great book called The Bait of Satan, and literally, offense and strife is the bait of Satan to lure us into a life that's going to have no power, no victory. We're going to miss the call on our life. We're going to miss what God wants us to do and what he has for us. Okay, so associate pastor gathers up a few not so wise people. And the more they talk, the madder they get, the more they find wrong. And so they decide that they're just going to leave and go start their own church. And I can tell you there's very few churches that this hasn't happened in. It's called church splits. And so now let's just say the congregation is about 400 people and he takes 100 of them and goes a mile down the street and starts his own church. Now, pastor has a decision to make. Is he going to get mad? Is he going to lose his peace? Is he going to get angry? Is he going to start worrying and being afraid that, oh, he's losing his people and now he's going to go down the drain? First thing he needs to say is, well, God, we know that this is not being handled right and it hurts me and I think it's terrible, but I put my trust in you and anybody that leaves, you can give me three more in each person's place. Can I just tell you this? Anything that's not of God is not going to prosper. So we don't really have to worry about it too much. And then if he's really wise, what he should do is go buy the guy a sound system. Wow. Why would I want to do that? Because that's the way a Christian fights. That's the way you win your battles. That's the way you win your wars. Now, I know this is like a totally like sounds like crazy kind of thinking, but what do we think the Bible means when it says, bless your enemies? Is that just a little floaty spiritual sounding? Oh yes, bless your enemies. <laughs> There's too many things in the Bible that we never turn into practicality. We just sing about them and we confess them and we, we think they're cute little scriptures and we think somebody else ought to do it. But when it needs to be applied to our life, well, why would I want to bless my enemies? Nobody said you want to. What makes you think you have to want to, to do it? Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. He made that plain, Father, if you can remove this cup from me, please do. However, your will be done and not mine. I don't have to feel like doing everything to do it. What if somebody would have showed up here this morning and said, oh, guys, sorry, Joyce didn't feel like coming today, so she just, she wanted to fly out early. <laughs> you don't have to feel like being friendly with somebody to be friendly. You don't have to feel like smiling at them to smile. And that pastor doesn't have to feel like buying that guy's sound system to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit if that's what God leads him to do. Is anybody seeing what I'm saying here about the power of being a blessing? Because what happens when he does that, when he trusts God and he does good, he puts himself right clearly in a position for a miracle from God. And that's what we need. Second Timothy chapter 4. Verses 5 through 7. As for you, this is Paul's instruction to Timothy. But let's don't read it like it's just for Timothy. Let's take this in like it's for us. As for you, be calm and cool and steady. <laughs> calm and cool and steady. Accept and suffer. Uh-oh. unflinchingly <laughs> whoa you mean I can't even make a face <laughs> every hardship do the work of an evangelist 
fully perform all the duties of your ministry. So he doesn't get out of fulfilling his responsibility and his duty just because he's having a hardship. Hmm. Let's just say that you sign up to work in the nursery one Sunday a month at church and your Sunday rolls around and you didn't have a very good Saturday. It's a character test. What are you going to do? You're going to just not show up and not even tell anybody, which that's what a lot of Christians do. They sign up, but don't show up. Oh, nobody will miss me. I'm just one person. Or maybe you even do let somebody know that you're not coming. But the whole reason why you didn't come is because you're not in the humor. You don't want to. You had a bad day. Let me tell you something. The only time we grow spiritually is when we do what's right when it doesn't feel right. Come on. I mean, if I feel like doing it, that's no test. But man, if everything in me wants to tell you off and instead I pray for you, now I'm growing. If everything in me wants to bail on my commitment, but because I want to be a person of excellence and integrity, I go ahead and I ask God for the grace to do it anyway. And I do it with a smile on my face without complaining. Now I'm growing. Come on, it's easy to say. If I said, how many of you want to grow in God? There would not be one hand in here that wouldn't go up. Everybody would lift their hand. Well, you're not going to grow without something that makes you grow. I can't get more muscle unless I lift a heavier weight. Amen. We have to stop being afraid of hard things. We have to stop backing down for the fight. We're going to read verse five again and then go through verse seven. As for you, be calm and cool and steady, accept and suffer unflinchingly every hardship. Do the work of an evangelist, fully perform all the duties of your ministry, for I am already about to be sacrificed. My life is about to be poured out as a drink offering. The time of my spirit's release from the body is at hand, and I will soon go free. Now watch this. I have fought the good, worthy, honorable, and noble fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Wow. 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 You see, I made a decision about 20 years ago that I was going to finish. I was reading John 17, came across verse 4, where Jesus said, Father, glorify me now, for I have completed the work that you have given me to do. And I had a touch from God when I read that, and I began to weep and weep and weep. And I made a commitment to God right there I'm going to finish my race. With your grace and your help, I want to stand before you and be able to say, I did all of what you wanted me to do. I didn't do 10% of it. I didn't do half of it. I didn't do 90% of it. I didn't quit somewhere along the way because it got hard. I didn't give up because I got old. I didn't quit because I wasn't being appreciated. I didn't quit because I was being attacked. I want to finish my race. And let me tell you something. I don't think anything is going to feel better than that. Make your mind up today that you're going to finish, that you're going to learn how to fight the good fight of faith. You're going to learn how to fight like God would fight, fight like a Christian, and you're going to go all the way through to victory. Nobody can make this decision for you. Nobody. I love that scripture. The Bible talks about warfare. It talks about weapons. We're soldiers. We're in the army of God. And we can't win our battles if we're angry. You can't even pray effectively if you're angry. The Bible says, when you pray, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them, let it go. 
You know these scriptures, don't you? But you know, if I had an open altar up here, maybe not so much now, but if I would have just got up here this morning and said, you know, I'd love to pray for everybody in here who's angry, bitter, resentful. You have some kind of unforgiveness in your heart. Just come on down. <laughs> come on, you're seeing the picture. What do you think we would have had? Well, I can't help how I feel. I know that. I agree. But you can control yourself and choose to do what's right, no matter how you feel. Now, if you were here last night, you might be saying, well, aren't you kind of repeating yourself? Didn't you say this last night? Yes. Well, we'll get around to that, but right now we got to make sure you're going to do the first thing you heard. Yeah. Ephesians 4 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, do not offend or vex or sadden him by whom you were sealed, marked, and branded as God's own, and secured for the day of redemption, of final deliverance through Christ from evil and the consequences of sin. Let all bitterness, now these go together. He's getting ready to tell us how we offend the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness and indignation and wrath, passion, rage, bad temper, resentment, anger, animosity, quarreling, brawling, clamor, contention, slander, evil speaking, <laughs> abusive, blasphemous language be banished from you. Now, you know, if you really want to get stuff like this in you, you should take that scripture, write down each one of those words, and look each one of them up in a the dictionary and see what they mean. Because, you know, we can just slide over this stuff. And what do we do instead? Here's the way to fight like a Christian.
and become useful and helpful and kind to one another. Tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted, forgiving one another readily and freely as God in Christ forgave you. <laughs> See, we don't want to just stop doing the wrong thing. We want to start doing the right thing. And the thing is, is if I start doing the right thing, then when the devil comes back, there's no room for him because I'm not just an empty shell waiting for him to come and do the same thing to me today that he did yesterday. You have no idea how powerful it makes you if you make a decision that you're going to be a lover of people and you are going to be an on-purpose person who doesn't wait to feel like being a blessing to somebody, but you do it on purpose. I wonder how many people sitting in this room made a plan this morning to do something good for somebody today. Now you actually thought it through. I got my plan. I've already got a target picked out. When I get out of here, somebody on my team is getting a blessing. You know why? I think I've done some damage here today. And you know, I'm tired and I could think, well, I sure hope somebody blesses me. But I think I'm just going to go ahead and give the devil another black eye and just not do good in the pulpit, but just keep doing good. There's all kinds of scriptures about the importance of peace. The Bible says we have to pursue peace. If you want to have peace in your life, you're going to have to really want to have peace. And you're going to have to want it enough to be willing to make changes in order to have it. But let's talk about some of the anger that's in the world today. And, you know, it's one thing if somebody hurts your feelings and you get angry and you deal with it and get over it. But, you know, there are people that have deep-seated anger in them. And, and can I just say that if you, are, if you are blowing up all the time over petty stuff and things that don't make much sense, there's something wrong. And it's something that you may have buried and forgot about a long time ago, but let me tell you, it's our secrets that make us sick. It's the things that we need to deal with and get out in the light, invite God into those dark places of your life, and get to the root of things. I was angry and blowing up all the time and you know, uh, an angerholic. <laughs> Their theme in life is you made me mad. <laughs> well, Dave made me mad because he played too much golf. And Dave made me mad because he watched too many sports. And my kids made me mad because they were messy. And somebody else made me mad because they didn't make me feel right. And somebody else made me mad because of this and this. And if you would just stop making me mad. I don't even know what I'm talking about. You know, I saw a movie about a guy that was a wife abuser and he'd beat his wife all the time and every time he'd beat her up, he'd say, now look what you made me do. If you continue my word, you will know the truth. The truth will make you free. The truth will make you free. We need to ask God to come and mess in all the dark, deep, secret places of our life and we need to be ready to get to the root of our behavior. I was angry and blowing up all the time. And to be honest, I was just very hard to keep happy. I was a high maintenance individual. Now, I know none of you are like this. So just. And I didn't realize that it was still from my childhood. That I was angry. I had deep-seated anger in me because I'd been abused as a child. My childhood had been stolen. I never really got to be a kid. And not only because of the abuse, but I had a shame-based nature. I was operating from a basis of shame. I'm sure at some point I started out being ashamed of what my dad was doing to me, and then somehow or another I internalized that it became ashamed of myself and thought, well, there's something wrong with me because he's doing this to me. Must be my fault. 
And I had a record playing in my head for years. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And I thought because I left home and got away from the problem that I didn't have the problem anymore, but I had it in me. And there is value in letting God and the counselor of the Holy Spirit show you the root of your problems. It's amazing what understanding does for us. You don't have to go on a digging expedition and, you know, get a, but ask God to show you, ask God to show you. And there was something wrong with me and I didn't know what it was. I loved God and I, I went to church and I wanted to be nice. I, I wanted to be better, but I didn't know what my problem was. For example, I had a very difficult time showing mercy to people. I was just harsh and hard and I had my rules and guidelines. And if you didn't follow them, I was going to be upset. Don't I sound like I was rough to live with? <laughs> but just for my benefit, is there anybody that's tracking with me and you kind of know what I'm talking about? And maybe if you're not like that, you're living with somebody who is. I think my congregations are split in half. You're either like me or you're like Dave. And I can help you on either end. <laughs> and so God showed me after I started asking God, why do I have such a heart? Why am I so hard hearted? <laughs> well, one thing I was afraid to be tender and soft because I thought if I didn't, that I'd get walked all over, mistreated. I was afraid to really trust God to be my vindicator because in case he didn't come through, I wanted to let these people know that nobody was going to push me around again. Because you know, when we do things on our timetable, then we don't have to worry about whether God's going to come through or not. But let me ask you a question. Is what you're doing working? No, I can answer it for you. No, it's not working. You're digging a deeper hole every day. So here I'm full of shame. I didn't like myself. So how could I like anybody else? You can't give away what you don't have. I couldn't love Dave properly. I didn't love me. I couldn't love people. I found something wrong with everybody because I was constantly finding something wrong with me. <laughs> I couldn't be merciful to other people because I didn't know how to receive mercy from God. I was hard on myself. Every time I didn't do the right thing that I thought I should do as a Christian, then I went through my pattern of guilt and condemnation and punishing myself and refusing to enjoy life. And then I'd finally get over it and then I'd sin again. And I lived in that pattern for years and years. And I'm here to tell you that it has taken 37 years, but you are looking at a free woman. Amen. I'm talking, I am changed. I mean, you got to really push me now. to make me mad. And even if you're successful, I won't stay mad very long because I know the danger. And I open my mouth and say, God, this hurts so bad. I feel like my guts are going to fall out, but I trust you. And you show me what I can do to be a blessing for somebody because I fought my way for a lot of years and it about killed me. Now I'm learning how to fight like a Christian. I'm learning how to fight like God fights. Amen. 
So, but what we normally do when there's something wrong with our life, we just kind of cover it up some way. We don't want to deal with it. If God starts to mess in our problems and we get a little bit too close and he starts, then we're just like, no, we don't have no time for that. Well, I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you or not, but I can remember several occasions when I would open my refrigerator and smell like, whew. Close the door and hope the next time it's gone. So go back, open the refrigerator. Rotten broccoli is the worst. It is just like the worst. And so then maybe I'd move a few things around and then I can't find it, you know. Oh, I know what I'll do. Ah, oh, that'll take care of the problem. Some of you have been spraying perfume on your stink long enough. And you know, I didn't want to take the refrigerator apart. I didn't want to have to get everything out and set it on the table and take out the vegetable drawers, take out the fruit drawers. And there was a drain in the bottom of the refrigerator under all those drawers. I don't think refrigerators are even like that today, but the old kind were. And man, it was messy, especially if you hadn't been in there in like five years. And you know what we do? We dress it up. We take it to church. Praise the Lord. This is the way we go to church. This is the way we go to church. This is the way we go to church every Sunday morning. This is the way we go back home. This is the way we go back home. This is the way we go back home. No different than when we went. And God's saying it's time for deep cleaning. Throw away your odor spray. Invite the Holy Ghost into the deepest, darkest places of your life and say, God, I don't care how bad it hurts. I refuse to live in deception. I am going to take responsibility for my behavior and I want you to show me what the root of my problem is. Amen. Do you know what would happen if our politicians would pray a prayer like that about our country? If they'd have one good prayer meeting, God, show us what the root of the problem is with the violence in the world today. <laughs> show us what's wrong in our schools, God. Oh. Oh, yeah. Hmm. The Ten Commandments, hmm. Oh yeah, we did take those out of the schools. We didn't want anybody to be offended when they saw them. <gasps> you know what? <laughs> we have a panel for this problem and a panel for that problem, and a study group for this problem, and another group of experts for that problem, and the problems just keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse. The answer to everything is find out what God wants you to do and do it. Just do it. What is wrong with anybody that would forbid a child to pray? Or to bring their Bible to school? You know what? I'm determined to be a happy Christian. And I can't be a happy Christian and I can't influence anybody else if all I'm doing is spraying odor spray all over my own messes. We don't need a world full of wounded healers. We need people that were hurt that get healed and then they're ready to help somebody else. How can, how can the blind lead the blind?
Now I'm going to tell you something. My message is fun. But you pray that prayer and you go home and God starts ripping things apart. You better find something to hold on to. Because it's not going to feel good, but it will later. Later on. Later on. And you know what? Later on is going to come. So let me ask you a question. A year from now, do you want to be the same as you are right now? Okay, then let's use this year to go through. Come on, is anybody home today? Let's use this year to go through. Let's get to the bottom and the root of our messes. Let's get rid of all the odor spray. We often spend our whole life just dealing with bad behavior in ourselves, and yet we never take the time to get to the root of it. Go ahead. I just, I challenge you to start asking God, God, why do I lose my temper so easy? Why, why do I, why do I gossip so much? <laughs> why, why am I jealous of that person? Why did I get mad when they got promoted? If I'm insecure, why am I insecure? Not just expect everybody to keep me fixed all my life. But what's wrong in me that makes me react that way all the time? If I'm jealous of others who have more than me, why am I jealous? You know, every once in a while, I'll feel jealousy towards someone, and I have to talk to myself. I have a meeting with myself, and you know what I say? Joyce, that is like super stupid. <laughs> I mean, how could you possibly, Joyce, be jealous of anybody? How could you possibly be jealous of anybody? So then I have to remind myself that God has an individual plan for each one of us, and it's none of my business what he does for somebody else, that the only thing I'm responsible for is what he does for me. Learn to talk back to the devil. When he's putting lies in your head, oh, they're getting ahead of you. Then you open your mouth and say, no, God's in charge of promotion. He lifts one up and he brings another down. Let him who has my word speak my word faithfully, the Bible says. Learn how to talk out loud and get the word of God in your mouth. And I know a lot. I mean, I was in church for years. I would have thought it would have been stupid to walk around my house talking to myself. I talked to myself, but it was like, I'm so sick and tired of my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's me. I'm always wrong about everything. I'm just so stupid. I'm so dumb. You just, everybody you knew me. Let me ask you a question. Has your mouth got saved yet? Come on. Has your salvation reached your mouth? I can only say that to you because I remember when God said it to me. He said, you know, Joyce, you need to get your mouth saved. Your salvation hasn't reached your mouth. I don't give out anything I haven't had to eat. If I feel like I have to be in control all the time to be happy, why? If I have to feel like I have to have my own way all the time or I can't be happy, why? I need to begin to own my problems and so do you. If
you're angry, you need to say, you know what? I'm angry. And I get mad way too often and it's not right. And it's not what God wants. And God, I need you to show me the root of it. I want to change. I want to change. You know, we can't just keep the old nature and stick a few religious labels on it. <laughs> but I go to church. I mean, don't we realize that the greatest problem we have in the world today is so many people claiming to be Christians, but not acting like one at all. I mean, there's some mean Christians in the world, man. Luke chapter five says that you cannot put a new patch on an old garment. You cannot put new wine into all wine skins. And that's what we're trying to do when, when we, nothing changes inside and we're just slapping all this religious behavior all over us. You got to put off the old man and put on the new man. Put off anger, put on love. And let me clearly say, we can't do any of this without the help, the grace, the mercy of God. Don't ever try to do anything. Don't even try to go home and change unless you're going to start by saying, now God, clearly let me say that I know that I can do nothing without you. There's no amount of self-control. There's no amount of willpower. Nothing is going to help me but God. And when you ask God to help you, you may go through a period of time where you don't feel like he's doing anything. And you may have to stand steadfast and say, I'm not getting into works of the flesh. I'm asking you to show me what this problem is. And I'm asking you to do the work in me that needs to be done. I teach on grace a lot. And grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. We make an effort, but we don't earn the love of God. You see, God loves me and you just the way we are. I don't need to change to get his love. I want to change because I love him and I want to represent him better. I might even stay angry a lot, blow up two, three, four times a week, still go to heaven. But I want something more than that. I don't want to just squeak in the back door of heaven and still be in kindergarten when I get there. Amen. Can I tell you something? And a lot of you are really serious about God. You wouldn't be out here on Saturday morning if you weren't. So, you know, in a way, I guess I'm probably just maybe reaffirming a lot of things that you already know, but I'm not just preaching to you today. There's all, there's millions of people that are going to watch this by TV in 70 languages all over the world. And That's kind of overwhelming when you think about it. But what I'm trying to say is if, if, you're, if you're not a believer in Christ, then please accept him and become one because there's no, help with, no hope without him. And if you are a Christian, then be a serious Christian. Be a committed Christian. Be a Christian who walks in the fruit of the Spirit. Get to the root of the problems in your life and stop just blaming them on everybody else. Take responsibility for your behavior. Cry out to God to help you and to change you and let him do a work in your life. There's nobody in here or nobody watching my TV. If you pray this prayer, God, I want to be what you want me to be. I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know what I need to see, but I'm sure that I'm deceived in a lot of areas. And I probably think other people are at fault when really it's me. I want to take responsibility for my behavior. It's not somebody else's job to keep me happy. I'm asking you, God, and even if I try to take it back, God, don't listen to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, I pray like that. I'm asking you, God, to do whatever you need to do in my life to help me be the kind of person that you want me to be. Now, God's gonna, not going to dump it all on you at one time. That's why I'm saying 37 years down the road. But hey, it's been an exciting...
exciting journey. One of the reasons why so many Christians are bored is because they're not really interacting with God in their everyday lives and letting him take the lead. He comforts and encourages, but he also rebukes and warns. I think my messages are comforting. I think I give you hope, but I think they also have correction in them and direction. And I think that's the way that our preaching should be. You don't need to be brought into a building every week and just told how wonderful you are and how great your life is going to be if you just come to church every week. That's nonsense. We know that doesn't work. We've got to get it working in the marketplace, in the grocery store, in our home, on our good days, on our bad days. Some angry people come from angry families. They learned anger growing up. And you know, sometimes you have to unlearn something you learned. My dad was angry and he dealt with everything with anger. And so I started dealing with everything with anger. Make the kids mind by getting angry. If you're an angry man, you think you can stop the wife from spending too much money by getting angry. She knows how to hide stuff from you. Stop the husband from watching too many sports by getting angry. Make the grown children come to your house at Christmas instead of going to the in-laws by getting angry. Got somebody, didn't I? What do you mean you're not going to spend Christmas Day with me? You know what? I just set my kids free. I'm just like, hey. I want you to enjoy the holidays. I don't want you to be under some kind of law. I'd love to have you come. If you can stay an hour, come. If you can stay 30 minutes, come. If you can stay all day, come. There's no rules. I just love you. I just love you. Because if anybody is pressuring them from the other side... I don't want them to get it from me too and end up hating holidays. How many of you sometimes in your life, to be honest, you've just gotten to where you can't hardly stand holidays because all you do is run from place to place to place to place trying to keep all these people happy that you're not even sure you like. And going in debt every year at Christmas, spending the whole year paying it off to buy presents for people you don't like. Hallelujah. <laughs> Unmet needs make us angry. You should meet my needs. You know what? I stayed mad at so many people for so long because they weren't giving me what I thought they should give me. I finally just decided to bless myself. <laughs> I'm not kidding. If Dave don't bring me a present when I think he should, I'm happy to go out and buy myself one. Come on. Well, God's Word teaches us that we are to fight the good fight of faith. But you know, when we fight as Christians, we fight in a different way than what you might ordinarily think. For example, one of the ways that we fight like a Christian is by totally trusting God to help us and to bring us through each of our situations. And when we do trust God, really trust God, it always brings us into his rest and into his peace. And so if you've got a fight to fight, I wanna make sure that you know how to fight like a real Christian. So we're offering you some teaching today, two CDs and one DVD uh, in a package called Fight Like a Christian. And we're offering you the secret power of speaking God's word out loud. It's a little book that we've been offering for a good while now. So many people just love this book. I mean, I even know people that carry it in their purse, like ladies that carry it in their purse or they carry it in their car. And I think it's going to really be a blessing to you. We need to know how to speak the word of God out loud and realize that when we do, we're